right, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Kennedy. Good morning to everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Jim, um, and everyone else uh, at Creative Morning for having me uh, speak to you all today, and to Kelly for actually suggesting that I come and speak to you all. Um, my name is Stephen Kennedy. I was born and raised not too far from here um, in what was known as the St. Bernard Housing Development, uh, which was a place that uh, was like a double-edged sword. Um, it had a, a lot of extreme poverty, um, violence, but also some great people that taught me uh, many lessons. Uh, while growing up in the St. Bernard Housing Development, um, I grew up in a broken home. Um, and growing up in a broken home uh, made me somewhat an uh, angry young man um, and also led to me making many uh, bad decisions um, in my life. Um, wind up going to live with my aunt, uh, Alice, who actually really saved my life um, and led to me going to a place called Boys Town in Omaha, Nebraska, um, which uh, gave me the opportunity to graduate high school. Uh, I was always a smart kid, but I was always uh, a troubled kid just growing up in a dysfunctional household. Um, and after leaving Boys Town, um, I came back to the city of New Orleans. Um, and coming back to the city of New Orleans, I stayed a little bit um, in New Orleans before I went off to college um, at Grambling State University. Um, and while at Grambling State University, I was majoring in uh, civil engineering um, but as a young man, 17 years old, uh, you know, 17 year olds don't really know what they want to do at that time in life. Um, so I came back to New Orleans. Um, and when I came back to New Orleans, um, I got involved in the street life. Um, I started selling uh, narcotics and making bad decisions um, in my life and destroying communities. Uh, because there was really no other opportunities that existed, I felt, as a young black man. Um, here in the city of New Orleans. Uh, making a lot of those bad decisions uh, led me uh, to prison. Um, and while incarcerated, I had an opportunity to do a lot of self-reflection um, all my life. And I thought about, you know, all the decisions that I was making that was destroying communities and how my decisions was having a ripple um, effect on people's lives. Um, and so, when I came home, I actually came home a few months, uh, maybe six months before Hurricane Katrina um, hit the city of New Orleans. Um, and it was during that time where I never knew what an urban planner was, uh, to be honest with you. And so I attended all these meetings throughout the city of New Orleans, got involved in many different aspects, um, got involved with the Claiborne Quarter uh, study and helping, you know, submit a grant um, in that regards. And, um, just attending a lot of meetings, which led me to go to the University of New Orleans, um, just talking to some professors. And it was like urban planner. I'm like, oh, OK, that sounds like something that I'd be interested in. I get to focus on the social aspects of communities, the environmental aspects of communities, and the economic in, in, um, aspects of communities. Um, and so just kind of getting involved in a lot of that work, um, I started you know, doing a lot of advocacy work around the city of New Orleans, so advocating for minority and women-owned businesses, um, advocating for land use, uh, advocating for um, inclusive development. Um, and that led to me, um, I also attended um, Tulane University right after I finished um, the University of New Orleans in the Masters in Sustainable uh, Real Estate Development Program. And it was during that time I, I started uh, REO, um, LLC, and I started developing uh, affordable housing because I felt like growing up in, in poverty that folks, just because you was born into poverty, don't mean that you shouldn't have an opportunity to live in um, quality, affordable housing. So actually, uh, not too far from here, I developed uh, some affordable housing, a historic property uh, right behind Circle Food Store. And uh, my creative process to do affordable housing, I do what they call creative financing. Um, and so an affordable housing is not a highly lucrative business, but however, uh, it helps me uh, give back to the community. Yeah, I make some money, but also I think the most important piece is giving back. And so when I do affordable housing, I use various different uh, government incentive programs. So I might use like some funds from the city of New Orleans who've been a great uh, partner and the resource to providing some uh, funds through either home funds, I uh, also use like restoration tax abatement programs 
historic tax credit. So when I talk about creative financing, is that I, I stack every single possible government program possible in order to, you know, make housing affordable for the long term. And so uh, I have everything that I do, it has a ripple effect um, on other people's lives because not only do I provide affordable housing, I also provide contracting opportunities to minority and women-owned businesses um, so they can grow and they also can employ other individuals. You know, I also uh, advocate a lot, um, you know, for formerly incarcerated individuals to show folks that decisions that you've made in your past don't dictate your future. Because most of the time, folks feel like decisions that you've made, like I can look at you and the decision that you've made and I can always see who you are. But that's not necessarily true. Um, because as all human beings, none of us are perfect. Uh, we all make mistakes. Um, and once again, I think that uh, that's how I like to have an impact on the community. And so I, I'll just stop there and really want to open it up for questions. I, I like to have more dialogue and, and being engaged um, with folks. And so um, if Jim want to just kind of go into questions, um, that would be fine um, for me. Hello. Hi, it's Bethany Boltman from the New Orleans Musicians Clinic and Assistance Foundation. We have 2,600 patients, and we see that so many of them are housing insecure, which is going to impact their health care. And we need to come up with a new plan. And I, I know this is like a curveball, but we need to come up with a new plan because many of them are about to lose their homes through foreclosure. As insurance rates get higher, that will be the tipping point for them to lose their homes. And then we have others that are rental insecure that there is no place for them. I mean, it's like they're falling into a hole. So I know this is a huge curveball I just threw you, but we are desperate for a new plan, a new way out of the crisis that we're seeing. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so that, that's a great question, I, I guess, point that you made. Um, affordable housing uh, is a crisis across America. Um, for every one unit of affordable housing, there's 100 people who are requesting um, that affordable unit. So that's a huge crisis that we have across the country. I think that um, very other initiative, while some other folks are losing their housing, also property taxes. Um, here in the city of New Orleans, uh, many neighborhoods have seen uh, super increasing in their property values. Uh, and that has led to, you know, extensive amount of property taxes also increasing um, because property taxes actually takes first lien position over your mortgage. So if you don't pay your property taxes, you can lose your house before um, even paying your mortgage. And so I think Representative Matt Willer actually is introducing um, some legislation in the up and coming session, um, a constitutional amendment um, to basically kind of put a freeze on folks' property taxes. And I think that would help. But also, um, I, I'm excited to uh, finally see that Marcia Fudge, Congresswoman Marcia Fudge, uh, was confirmed by the Senate. Um, and so I think that her focus um, with HUD, I think that she's going to, her and, and President Obama and his, I mean, President Biden, I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm still stuck in the past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but President Biden um, and his team, I think that they're going to put a focus on creating more affordable housing in urban and rural communities. So um, do I think it's gonna be a silver bullet? I don't, but I do, I, I do, I do think that they're gonna put additional resources that can help communities um, like musicians um, to help uh, get, keep them in housing. I do think that that is coming. Um, and so I think that, you know, musician is the backbone of the city. We just heard a great musician just playing earlier. And so as we know, uh, musicians have been greatly impacted by this pandemic because they can't play in live audience, um, you know, and I, I, a friend of mine who's a, another great performer, Robin Barnes, uh, she's a, another great, you know, performer. And so I know a lot of musicians whose um, in, um, income has been impacted by, you know, the pandemic. And so uh, one thing that I like to encourage folks uh, as a real estate, you know, developer is that, you know, we need to invest you know, more and just buying property and maybe buying a double, you know, where you can live on one side and maybe rent out the other one um, when you have times like this when a pandemic comes. So uh, I hope that answers your question and, and we can have more dialogue, um, you know, and to follow up on that. Thanks for your question, Bethany. Uh, Stephen, um, 
Another uh, audience member has asked, what are some of the more used programs for uh, creative financing that you've seen? Yeah, so there, there's various uh, different programs. So for instance, they have a program called uh, New Market Tax Credits. That's mostly used, ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, New Market Tax Credit is another uh, government incentive program which mostly used for um, large commercial real estate development um, projects and also to finance businesses. This building that we actually are sitting in um, was actually funded by government programs. So the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program um, which is another program was created, um, basically became a part of the law with the um, 1986 uh, tax reform um, that helped produce uh, affordable housing, you know, across the country is another program. So home funds um, is another program that you can use for creative finance and restoration tax abatement um, is used to redevelop properties. So once again, I, as, I, as I explained earlier, when you go and buy an old historic property or just an old property um, and you rehab it, once again, once you rehab it and assess it, get, you know, that building permit, your property values um, increase and your property assessment increase. When your property assessment increase, your property taxes increase. So restoration tax abatement basically freezes the property taxes for five to possibly 10 years um, is a good program uh, to use as well. So that's just some of the some of the very different government programs. Community development block grant dollars um, is another source of funds that can be used for creative financing. So uh, most folks get intimidated um, by government programs just because there's a lot of paperwork, um, but it helps reduce uh, a lot of the risk um, in development projects just because you have, you know, government um, is there not to make a profit, but they're here to serve a social, you know, good, which is, you know, providing um, a service excuse me, to the community. And so that's how government kind of works with the private sector. They provide incentives, you know, by using taxpayer dollars um, and private sector, you know, uh, utilize those incentives in order to develop uh, either housing, which I've kind of focused on um, and do long-term affordability. So without a lot of government programs, I wouldn't be able to, you know, provide long-term affordability you know, for seniors, for artists, and all those different um, individuals who my company serve. Oh, <laughs> yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so, yeah, right now, uh, we actually in the pre-development phase. Um, I'm working on an apartment complex in partnership with the Housing Authority um, in the city of New Orleans to develop 22 units of affordable housing um, for seniors, uh, 55 and older. And so this development project is going to focus on uh, sustainability. And when folks hear sustainability, they like, Stephen, what does sustainability really mean? And once again, that's show you how the ripple effect um, for sustainability, we talking about stormwater management and stormwater uh, retainage. So we're going to re basically retain a lot of, as you know, we've been having a lot of rain over the last few days. And so um, what our project seek to do is retain some of that water where we can use that water to allow folks to maybe wash their cars um, to water plants, um, you know, that's, um, that's going to be at the project. But also we have uh, solar panels that's going to be on the development because, you know, seniors are on fixed incomes. And so, you know, they know every month they're probably getting, I think it's like $714 um, a month. And so with that fixed income, you know, we try to we're going to provide affordable housing that also, you know, allowed folks to have, they know that the uh, utility bill is not going to be increasing dramatically, you know, just because we have the solar panels. We're also going to put like low flow uh, shower heads uh, because sewage and water, bill, uh, those bills can be hefty, uh, as we all know. Um, and also we, we're doing, um, uh, we have them like, uh, like so, uh, low, they call it like low VOC, uh, and so that's just like another technical term um, in regards to like paint. And so we, we try to do all those sustainable components and adding a lot of those sustainable components costs. And so that's why government incentives come in and make these projects feasible um, because without them, you know, those projects wouldn't um, be feasible at all. And so this is a great project. Um, I'm excited on it. I've been working on it, uh, you know, for a while um, now. And, you know, and so, yeah, y'all can stay tuned to that. It's gonna be a, a fantastic project. Thank you for that question. Uh, Stephen, can you talk about your, since you work kind of in the reentry space, if you could, yes, can you yes. talk about more specifically about the work that you're doing with people that are coming back in? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, and that's why I was, I was so excited that Dominique, when I, when I, when I reached out to her, she said yes, because Dominique is doing, you know, great, great work. And so if you all can kind of help Dominique and Daughters, of Beyond, Daughters Beyond Incarceration. Um, that would help. Uh, I would appreciate that greatly. And so it's just organizations like, you know, Daughters Beyond Incarceration. I also, you know, did a lot of advocacy work you know, at the, at the Capitol, I'm, um, at the state Capitol, I should say, you know, advocating on criminal justice reform. Um, because people tend to uh, have a negative stigma when, when we talk about formerly incarcerated individuals. And I remember a friend of mine, Nancy, uh, we was in this program, um, actually with the city, I forgot the name of it, um, and, and her, her, uh, her uncle was the chief judge at the Louisiana Supreme Court. And she was like, Stephen, uh, you know what you went to jail for? And I got caught for, you know, because I'm black and she's white. She said, I would have never, ever went to jail, you know, for those type of things. And I just go to show you uh, the, injust the injustice that's in the criminal justice system. And so I think just kind of going through that system, you know, made me kind of be a huge proponent uh, for criminal justice reform and also reentry. And just like as I reiterated earlier, is that we make mistakes in life. Every single individual, and I don't know a perfect individual, um, not unless they're newborn babies or something like that, but uh, nobody is perfect. And so I advocate a lot um, in that regards and trying to get formerly incarcerated individuals job opportunities, showing them like, hey man, look at me, look at Stephen Kennedy. And, guys who know and see the change that I made, because people like to say, Stephen, you made a 360 degree change. I say, no, I'd have been back in the same spot if I made a 360 change. I actually made a 180 degree, <laughs> um, <laughs> 180 degree change in my life. And so I just like to show guys like, hey man, you can go through every single thing in life and all the eyes can be against you um, and you still can succeed. And one thing that I forgot to mention, um, when I came home in 2005, um, I actually went work for Sherman and Williams. Um, and when I went into Sherman and Williams and they asked uh, on an application, were you a convicted felon? I just left it blank. I said, when they find out, shit, they gonna find out whenever they find out. Cause I felt like um, that was a negative stigma anyway for even asking that question. That don't have nothing to do with my work ethics. Um, and I was, excuse me for cussing, I was busting my ass at this job. Cause I felt like, you know, this is my chance, I can, you know, do, I can rehabilitate myself, get back involved. Um, and after two weeks, um, I guess when the background check came in and I made, I just came back into the store on St. Charles Avenue, um, right before Felicity. Um, and I just came back from de delivering these big heavy ass buckets of paint, five gallon buck, I'm talking about, I was sweating my ass off. <laughs> And when I made it back into the store, uh, the store manager, you know, kind of called me in the office and um, I was just looking, he's like, yeah, you already know, huh? I'm like, yeah. And he was like, um, I try to advocate, you know, for you to the regional office. He said that Sherman and William just had a policy um, where they don't uh, hire convicted felons. Um, I wrote a real touching letter to the uh, CEO of Sherman Williams. Um, I never heard anything back um, from him. I didn't expect it. Um, and I cried, to be honest with you. Uh, I really, it, it hurted me because I felt like, damn, I'm trying to get my life in order. Um, and here nobody wanted to give me a chance. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and um, the Most High, you know, allowed me to, you know, get involved and, in, you know, me going to the University of New Orleans. Um, I have a hell of a story to tell and, and I think it can be an inspiration to anybody, you know, no matter what you go through, no matter what people say, um, don't worry about it, turn off all the, turn off, you know, tune out all the naysayers and just do the shit. That's how I feel. Sorry, I cuss a lot, so, you know, <laughs> people be like, Steve, man, you be, you be cussing. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm authentic, man, I am who I am, you know, I'm, I'm my mother's child. <laughs> And I'm also a poet, I forgot to say that as well. Um, so if y'all wanna hear a piece of poetry, I can do that as well. Um, yeah. I would yeah, I think we would love to hear more about that and yeah, just kind of. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm a poet. Um, I haven't written in, in a while, but um, while incarcerated, uh, I did um, write this poem um, that said, that's titled Lost Fate. Um, so it's real short and I just uh, run through it if that's okay. 
Um, it said, uh, how could you fix your lips to say that I have lost faith in him? When I is he and he is them, and from them is who I've learned to sin. So it's not God that I've lost faith in, it's just that my faith has been lost in men. See, most people are programmed with this false cognitive sense of man's soul. So we must all realize that there is nothing really good or bad. It's just that our thinking makes it so. See, little boys in the ghettos are not born drug dealers. It's just the seeds of poverty with attributes to these disenfranchised youth. So that's why they sell drugs and tote guns and be ready to shoot. And them same little girls in their hoods be ready to sell their bodies for a pair of Prada boots. All because somebody lied and told her that she would be labeled as cute. So therefore, I must refute and continue to speak to the youth, letting them know that all that they hear, that shit ain't really the truth. See, I was told I wouldn't live to see 24, but now I'm a little bit over 40 and I ain't even in the game no more. See, as a youngster, I was confused thinking those streets would get me rich. Plus the money I was making had me feeling like nobody can tell Steve shit. Truth to the matter is those streets have bought me more hurt than bliss. That's why sometimes when I walk around, I be pissed thinking about the years that I shared with my lost peers and how when I, shared, and how when I see their mothers, it caused me to share a tear. So it's not God that I've lost faith in, it's just that my faith has been lost in my peers. So that's just a little, you know, I try to be a little creative and show y'all, you know, a little something, you know. <laughs> you know I, but um, I just love life, man. I just, you know, love everything about it. And I, I want to thank Creative Mornings once again for, you know, giving me, you know, this opportunity just to share with you all um, this morning and hopefully other folks that, you know, get to see this video that it can be an inspiration and show you how uh, the ripple effects uh, of poverty, you know, can have on people, you know, no matter where you stay in urban and rural environments, no matter what color you are. Um, and so hopefully that one day we can address that problem um, here in America um, so we can have a positive ripple effect instead of a ne negative ripple effects on communities.